I'll declare the meeting open at 6.01. The City of Vincent would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. CEO, we've obviously got one notable apology. This uh, member on a proof leave of absence this evening. Um, would you read out the details? Uh, yes, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, we have uh, an apology from Councillor Joanne Fatakis this evening, and also noting that Mayor Emma Cole is on approved leave of absence from Council from the 17th of September to the 12th of October inclusive. We'll now move on to public question time and the receiving of public statements. We'd like to uh, welcome you to the meeting. Um, just for uh, uh, members of the community in the gallery, the City will be live streaming the meeting, but we turn the stream off during this section of the agenda and we'll resume at the conclusion of public question time. This is an opportunity for you to come up and speak or ask questions. There's no order. Um, however, when you come to the microphone, we ask that you state your name, address and the item or subject that you're addressing this evening. Everybody gets three minutes. There's a timer, so if you hear the alarm, it's time to wrap up. Um, and we'll be dealing with approved deputations um, later in the agenda. Um, and of course, we ask that everyone is respectful and considerate of the views of others. Can I have the first speaker, please? Deputy Mayor, we have two applications for leave of absence, the first being Councillor Dan Loden requesting leave of absence from 25th of September to the 28th of September inclusive due to work commitments, and the second also from Councillor Loden requesting leave of absence from 7th of October to the 13th of October inclusive for work commitments. Um, do we consider those as a group or separately? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, given that Councillor Loden has um, submitted them and they appear the, in the agenda separately, it would be best to uh, treat them as two separate motions. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the request from Councillor Loden for leave of absence from the 25th to the 28th of September inclusive? Councillor, move Councillor Castle, second of Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I call it carried. And um, can I have a mover and a seconder for Councillor Loden's request for a leave of absence from the 7th of October to the 13th of October 2018 inclusive? Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I call it carried. We'll now move on to the receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. We have one deputation tonight, um, I believe in relation to item 9.4, is it? Yes, for Boar Avenue. Um, I believe Jincia is you presenting tonight, or Justin Mortley will be presenting. Thank you. <coughs> Justin, you've got up to 15 minutes. Brilliant. Okay, so this, this time I've, I've practised it a whole lot better, so bear with me. So I'm... Um, ...a seconder for the um, confirmation of minutes of the council meeting of the 28th of August 2018. Moved Councillor Loden. Second, Councillor Murphy. Uh, all in favour? I call it carried. We'll now move on to announcements. Um, oh, my apologies. We also have the um, special council meeting of the 11th of September. That's correct, yes. Um, can I have a mover? Councillor Toppelberg. Second, Councillor Loden. All those in favour? It's carried. Thank you. Um, We'll now move on to the announcements by the presiding member, which is me. So, um, <laughs> uh, I I'm going to use my time in the chair wisely. I just look. I just want to mention that the Greening Vincent Garden competition, which has been running since Vincent became Vincent, is on again this year. Um, entries open to residents, ratepayers, and businesses with property in Vincent, and there are a number of categories: uh, best business garden, catchment friendly, verge, food garden, courtyard and balcony, and residential gardens. It's such a fantastic event to be part of, and I would urge all the green thumbs out there to head to our website, find out more, and get their entry in by the 5th of October. Um, so now that I've done that announcement, I think I also should be acknowledging that tonight is the final council meeting for our outgoing Chief Executive Officer, Len Kosova. It's his 
favourite thing to have people talk about him. Um, the, then your achievements in the role speak for themselves and the change that you've led at Vincent has benefited both our city but also um, the local government sector more broadly. Um, and you have my absolute congratulations for being someone who both challenges and changes the status quo. Um, it's been such a great pleasure to work with you and I wish you all the best um, as you step away to um, spend more time with family and um, explore other career opportunities. So on behalf of Council, I thank you. Um, however, ever onwards, folks, uh, Vincent will be welcoming David McLennan, who will be taking the helm as, as Chief Executive Officer. David brings a passion for people along with extensive public sector leadership, project management and infrastructure management experience to the role of CEO. Uh, David will be commencing in October and we look forward to welcoming him then and continuing to deliver uh, progressive, innovative, open and accountable local government. Um, CEO, did you wish to respond or to say any, uh, not last words, but you know, <laughs> any words to mark the occasion? Um, through you, presiding member, um, only briefly, I won't bore the gallery, um, other than to say it's been a real privilege to serve the community of the City of Vincent. It's been fabulous working with this council and also with this administration. Um, the CEO uh, is often responsible for taking more than their fair share of the blame and less than their fair share of the credit, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. I'd just like to thank the whole of the staff of administration for all of the support, encouragement and motivation that they've shown while we've been on a pretty progressive change journey over the last four years. Thanks uh, also and specifically to the exec team. Uh, it's been a great privilege serving with all of the directors and we've invested an enormous amount of time and energy and effort in always trying to do right by the community of the city of Vincent. Um, it has been the one purpose and passion that I'm pleased to say the whole organisation has really been focused on. And I think um, we've been able over the last few years to, um, to focus on a narrative of us and we, not I and me. And in that regard, uh, I would simply say it's been a real honour. Uh, thanks for the opportunity in the first instance and after 23 years in local government, I'm now looking forward to pursuing new opportunities. So thanks for all your support. Thank you, CEO. Uh, we'll now move on to declarations of interest. Uh, through you, presiding member, we have a few this evening. Firstly, we received a disclosure of impartiality interest from Councillor Ros Harley in relation to item 9.4, Bulwer Ave, Perth. Uh, Councillor Harley has disclosed an impartiality interest in this matter on the basis that she has an association with the applicant, the association being that the applicant is known to Councillor Harley through a mutual friend over a long period of time. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Harley's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Harley has declared she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The second interest I've received is also an impartiality interest declaration from Councillor Jonathan Hallett on item 9.2, uh, the proposed uh, eating house change in Bulwer Street, Perth. Councillor Hallett has disclosed that he has an association with the applicant, the association being that he resides in a property diagonally behind the premises in question, next door to where a noise sensitive receiver was located for the acoustic report. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Hallett's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Hallett has declared he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Uh, I, a CEO Link Sober, have disclosed a financial interest in item 18.1, a confidential item relating to Chief, to Chief Executive Officer's annual performance review. The nature of my interest is that it relates that, that item relates to my performance in the role of Chief Executive Officer, my remuneration and my contract of employment with the City. Uh, as a consequence, there may be a perception that my, imp my impartiality on the matter could be affected. In relation to uh, item 11.2, I've received a financial interest disclosure from Councillor Jimmy Murphy. That's the authorisation of expenditure report. The nature of Councillor Murphy's financial interest in this matter is that upbeat events, which Councillor Murphy operates, has been contracted to deliver parts of the town team movement conference, which the city was a sponsor of. Councillor Murphy is not seeking any approval from Council to remain in the Chamber, participate in the debate or to vote on the matter when it is discussed. 
And lastly, I've received a proximity interest disclosure from Councillor Josh Toppelberg on item 9.6, the proposed amendment to built form policy. The extent of Councillor Toppelberg's interest in this matter is that his family owns a property at 346 to 352 William Street within the area that is subject to the William Street guidelines. Councillor Toppelberg is seeking Council's approval to participate in the debate only, but not to vote on the matter, nor to participate in the debate relating to the William Street guidelines attached to the policy. Um, on that matter, Council members, under section 5.68 of the Local Government Act and clause 2.17 of the Meeting Procedures Local Law, Council can consider and determine Councillor Toppelberg's request to participate in the debate on this particular item, notwithstanding his proximity interest disclosure, providing that Councillor Toppelberg uh, vacates the Chamber and Council then considers the matter in line with the requirements of the Act, which I'm happy to read out in a moment. Thank you, CEO. Let me just wait while Councillor Toppelberg vacates the chamber. Uh, through you, Presiding Member uh, Council, you can you have the ability under Section 5.68. So I just need to read out the full clause reference. Uh, s bracket 1 B Roman numeral 2 to approve Councillor Toppelberg's request to participate in the debate on this item notwithstanding his proximity interest, providing firstly that Councillor or Council is satisfied that Councillor Toppelberg's interest in the matter is so trivial or insignificant as to be unlikely to influence the disclosing member's conduct in relation to that matter. Um, noting though that um, Councillor Toppelberg is not seeking any permission to, re to debate or vote on the uh, William Street guidelines, which is the only aspect which he actually has an interest in. Councillors? Um, through you, um, Presiding Officer. Um, CEO, I'm wanting to unpick this a little bit in regards to the proximity interest being for the item number. Um, but count the, count, um, the councillor requesting that he participate essentially in part um, of the amendment, and I want your guidance um, on that. I'm actually generally not supportive of councillors who've declared a proximity interest in matters remaining in the chamber or participating in the debate at all. Um, and I note that Councillor Topberg has requested permission to participate. So at what at what point does the line get drawn to say you can participate on this, um, but but not that? And if the matter that Councillor Topberg is debating within that built form policy has any um, overlap, influence, etc., on the William Street part, which is where um, he's declared the proximity interest over. Um, through you, Presiding Member, yes, it's a valid point in relation to the crossover or, or mm -hmm. interrelationship between the policy and the guidelines which effectively are attached to and form part of the policy. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg is only seeking Council's approval to participate in the debate, but specifically not in relation to any aspect of the debate relating to the William Street guidelines. Uh, it might present somewhat of a challenge for council members to distinguish between any discussion that relates to the core policy or other guidelines um, that are attached to it, and then to divorce from that and isolate any discussion that council members might wish to have relating to the William Street guidelines in isolation once Councillor Tobelberg is out of the chamber if you were to uh, approve his uh, remaining in the chamber for the remainder of it. Mm -hmm. Anything further, Councillor Harley? Uh, I guess my other question is I'm not I've, um, I'm familiar with where the um, the property is that Councillor Berger has declared the interest over. I'm not familiar with whether that has a laneway or not, and I'm aware that that's part of the um, part of the debate in the built form policy about the um, rear setbacks. So I'm not I'm not aware of that detail. I'm I'm not supportive of Councillor Berger remaining in. Um, to participate in the debate, I think once you declare a proximity interest, it's my personal opinion that you, you, as I did in the town planning scheme debate, the entire town planning scheme, I left the chamber 
um, albeit that I had a property which has already been developed and I left the chamber um, based on sound advice. I accept that this is not the same scenario as Town Planning Scheme 2, though. Uh, any other commentary from councillors? Councillor Lowden. Um, I'm happy to support uh, Councillor Topperberg's participation in the the debate. Um, this the reform of the the bill form policy is a very significant reform of what we're of, of very significant policy for council. Um, and whilst he does have an interest in a component of it, that William Street, the fact that he's declared it, that we're aware of it, that he's aware of it, and everybody who's listening online and here is also aware of it, um, I think that gives us coverage of that item. Any further comments? Councillor Castle? Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, just a question for the CEO, if there would be a solution to this in by uh, separating out clause 1.3 from the amendment, from the, the report. Do you see any issues with proceeding down that path and would that then solve the problem? Um, through you, presiding member, uh, that that could occur in that the presiding member could require that the various components of the officer recommendation be put individually rather than as a whole. Uh, if that were the case, then it would go some way towards addressing the point that Councillor Harley raised in relation to um, dealing with the William Street design guidelines and any change that's proposed to them as part of a, a separate decision that's not the same decision relating to the policy. Um, but again, it's that's really just a matter for council to decide. Okay, so we would put the request for Councillor Toppelberg to be able to participate in the debate on the item relating to the built form policy. Um, but not to participate in the debate nor be present in the chamber for any discussion or decision in relation to the William Street guidelines? Uh, through you, presiding member, yes. If that's what council so chooses, then it has the right to apply whatever conditions it sees fit to Councillor Toppelberg's request, notwithstanding what that request actually entails. Can I have a move? Do I need a mover and a seconder for that motion as... Yep. Can I have a mover I'll for that, Councillor Harley? Seconded. Councillor Hallett. Councillor Harley, do you have any further commentary on this? Um, you know, it's a little bit unusual, but, um, you know, I, I trust your judgment, CEO, in making that advice to Council and I'm happy to support that to enable the Councillor to participate. Councillor Hallett, any other commentary? All right, I'll put it. All those in favour? And note that it's carried. Um, can we retrieve Councillor Toppelberg? Okay, so we'll now move on um, to um, uh, uh, the on block section of the uh, meeting prior to. Um, determining which items will be considered on block. Can I go around the chamber and just, um, if there are any councillor items that councillors wish to call out for debate? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, item 10.3, please. The trees are private property. Thank you. Councillor Lowden. Councillor Murphy. Councillor Harley. Councillor Castle. Councillor Hallett. CEO, I will leave it to you to read out the items that um, will now be will put on block. Thank you, presiding member. Uh, for those members of the galleries as well as anyone uh, streaming this meeting, I'll just now read out the um, report item numbers and the recommendations which council is about to adopt on block. Sorry, pardon me. Um, through presiding member, just noting that the presiding member has also withdrawn for separate consideration item 12.1.
So I'll now just read out all of the items that have not been uh, specifically requested to be withdrawn by council members, nor have they been subject of a uh, question. And as a consequence, the officer recommendation will be adopted on block. Um, for the items that are subject of public question, deputation or which council members have asked to be separately considered, they will be all considered individually once the on block items are uh, adopted. So the items which council will now adopt as per officer recommendations are item 9.2, 9.5, 9.6, 10.1, 11.1, 12.1, 13.1, 11.3, oh sorry, I just noticed, sorry, forgive me. Oh. Apologies, I'll go through this once more. And also I note that uh, Councillor Murphy's uh, financial interest disclosure also needs to exclude item, item 11.2. Okay, so I'll start again. On block items are item 9.2, 9.5, 10 10.1, 10 10.2, 11.1, 11.3, 12 11.2, 12.3, 12.4, 12.5 and 13.1. Thank you CEO. Can I have a mover and seconder for the on block items? Moved Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Okay, we'll now move through the agenda in the order that the items were raised from the gallery. Um, the first item is item 10.4, response to petition, Alma Road and Claverton Streets, North Perth, traffic calming. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Castle. Councillor Hallett. Um, thank you. I won't um, labour this one. I guess there was a lot of discussion last week about um, the administration's report and I guess some changes that Council was um, seeking to make to it. There's a couple of proposed amendments in front of you on yellow and green. Um, dark green, yep. Um, I guess the difference between the two amendments um, relate to whether or not we essentially embed some more community consultation with the um, petitioners um, before proceeding with any design um, changes or whether we go ahead with um, advertising for community consultation, the, the two locations suggested by administration originally, as well as do um, some additional community engagement in the area um, to look at more holistic um, approaches to traffic management in that um, space. Um, Given the, um, I guess, time that it's taken for um, the petitioners to um, raise this issue for council to address, I'm going to propose that we, um, well, I'm going to propose the amendment for the, the dark green one, yep, um, which approves a mid-block single lane slow point in Claverton between Camellia and Alfonso um, and a mid-block single lane slow point in Leak Street between Grosvenor and Kelmsford Roads um, and then authorises also the Director of Engineer to determine the precise location and extent of the proposed works described, um, engage with residents within the streets as nominated in the petition and the Urban Mobility Advisory Group on additional traffic calming measures in the streets nominated in the petition, including locations identified in item 2.3, which if we just jump back up to that, um, noted that there were three locations in administration's report where the speeds were close to the intervention level, but they didn't trigger um, administration's recommendation for um, implementation. Um, and lastly, that it notes that a further report will be presented to council by December with the outcome of the community engagement referred to. Um, admin will also be reviewing the operational guidelines used to determine interventions to reduce on-road speeds, and admin will inform the petitioners of the council's decision. Do I have a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Castle. Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak? Probably said enough, thanks. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I support this amendment. Um, I think that while the initial recommendations go some of the way to dealing with the issues in this area, as we've seen from both the data that was presented and from the um, 
the comments from the gallery, there's, there are other locations that also require some help. Um, and we can see that they are very close to that trigger level, so it seems um, rather arbitrary to cut them off at that point. Um, I also think it's very important that we that we look at the impact that um, traffic calming measures in one area of the of the precinct will have in the other areas, and that we can't just look at each individual street. Um, in a vacuum, we need to look at uh, the whole precinct. So um, I do support this amendment in um, preference to the other uh, on the basis that it allows us to push forward right now with some calming measures in both Claverton and Leek um, while still investigating some more measures that might happen in the surrounding streets uh, and not delaying those, those first two that have been identified while we wait for that. Councillors, any further comments? Through you, Chair. Um, I have a question in regards to um, Elmer Road, and I think it applies also to Coverton, if I've understood one of the um, comments, which is that the trucks are coming down, they're um, heading south on Charles Street, and they're turning left into Elmer Road, and they're literally getting a um, virtually a straight, a straight through run to North Perth Plaza. So I'm wanting to find out whether we have done, apart from noting how many cars um, go on these particular roads and also um, looking at some of the speeds. Have we looked specifically at how many trucks, what, when they're, albeit that I acknowledge that legally they absolutely are able to use that road, um, but do we have any other information in regards to the safety concerns um, that were raised or any other observations that we are able to make as a city? And have we, apart from the one example given, have we engaged at all with the um, uh, with the companies who control those trucks and also Coles North Perth as well. Um, perhaps the director can respond to that. Director. Okay. Through you, presiding member. Um, you'll see in the report that we have spoken to Coles and we uh, they subcontract their um, logistics side to toll, so we've had met with Coles and Toll who have both given a commitment that uh, the trucks won't travel on Alma Road. So, and they're doing things like geofelts in the trucks. And there was an instance where a driver did drive down Alma Road, and that's led to an internal disciplinary matter of the outcome, which we, we don't know. Um, you also see on the report that the, each of the um, traffic counters shows the percentage of commercial vehicles in relation to the total. So that gives us some idea of the potential, which is relatively small. Um, but to further answer your question, there's, uh, we've not spoken to any other companies because uh, it's not been highlighted to us that there's a specific company that, that has a lot of trucks travelling down Alma Road. Councillor Harley, anything further? Councillor Toppleberg. So I know it doesn't relate directly to the amendment, but just in relation to the response, when, when did those discussions take place with uh, Toll and Coles? So when was that commitment given? Uh, through you, presiding member, you tested my memory about the exact date, but it certainly happened in the last um, two months. And was that commitment provided in writing to us in any form, or was that just a commitment that was? Uh, I guess I'm going. Was there a suggestion of any level of recourse whereby, if those trucks are travelling down Alma Road, that residents can either report it, photograph it, or otherwise, and supply it to? Is there, is there some form of? commitment to it that's, that's written or is there is it just a, a general comment that they'll try and avoid driving down that street? Yeah, through your presiding member. Um, so there was a commitment. It was backed up with an email that they would instruct their drivers not to use Alma Road. So in other words, when they uh, uh, left the Coles car park, they would turn left, not right. Um, I mentioned the geofencing so they can identify uh, trucks that go down there. Um, and to answer your question about residents, they've had constant contact with us and they did um, see a truck driving down Alma Road. They took a picture. We got the registration and the truck as a number, a, t a toll number, which we passed on to uh, Coles, and that led to the internal disciplinary matter. So there is um, an ability for the residents to bring those issues to us, and we will we'll deal with them through Coles. Anything further? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, just on the back of that question then. So if they're not travelling down Alma Road, what streets are they travelling down to, just on the um, to follow up a comment... Um, in regards to um, there's always a, action for, a reaction to every action we take. So they stopped going down one street. So which residents are now um, having those trucks that formerly were going down Elmer Street now going down their street? 
because there's only a couple ways in there after you take out Albert and Claverton and View. Okay, so you preside, member. Uh, I'm looking at the map in front of me, which does help. So the loading bay is on Alma Road, so the very end of Alma Road. The instruction they've been given is to come out of the loading bay, turn left, small stretch of Alma Road, and then they hit Fitzgerald, and that's the network they've been told to use. Sorry, I'm um, through you, presiding officer, to the director. How do they get into Alma Road? Do they turn left off Fitzgerald Street now? So are they ta are they travelling north on Fitzgerald Street and now turning left into Alma Road, and then right into Coles Car Park? I just wanted to know, because somebody's affected. I'm just trying to figure out who. Um, th through you, presiding member, my understanding is it's via Fitzgerald. That is the route they're meant to take, and that's into the loading bay and to leave the loading bay as well. In other words, not to use Alma Road apart from the very short stretch which backs onto their loading bay. Any further questions or comments? Oh, look, I'll speak to the amendment. Um, look, I'm very supportive of this amendment. I think um, this item is about responding to a petition that we've received, and I think that um, this amendment goes some way to actually honouring the spirit of the petition that was presented to us here, um, namely that um, the amendment will ensure that we uh, take a, um, a precinct or a neighbourhood-wide or level approach to uh, consideration of traffic calming uh, and also that we engage with residents. Uh, so I'm very pleased to see this come forward. Um, I note that we have uh, the consideration of additional locations, uh, Alma Road Camellia and Alfonso Street, where the recorded speeds are close to the intervention level. And uh, I think that as, uh, if we take a higher level look um, we can absolutely see that intervention on adjacent streets is likely to lead to increased pressure on these streets that are already close to our current operational guidelines for intervention. So I'm very supportive of this amendment. If there's no further comments, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Councillors Hoppelberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, I'd like to propose an amendment which is an amendment to what is now uh, recommendation 4.2, which deals with the engaging with the residents. So that's still on the green now, but that's now formed part of the substantive. Um, just noting that uh, some of the issues that were raised in the petition and obviously uh, are causing angst for the petitioners and just so to ensure that we don't go and do the work two or three times that could otherwise be covered at the same time, it would be to insert the words after traffic calming, put comma, safety and, am and amenity measures. So it would say, engage with the residents within the streets as nominated, etc. on additional traffic calming, safety and amenity measures in the streets nominated, because that covers issues such as lighting, um, access and some of the other safety issues that were raised. I think it's important if we're going to have that direct engagement that we deal with that all at once. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Loden. Councillor Toppleberg, do you wish to speak? <laughs> Councillor Loden, is there any... Any comments? Any, okay, I'll push the amendment to amend item 4.2 after traffic coming to include the words safety and amenity measures. That's correct. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We are back to the substantive once again. Is there, would anyone, any councillors questions or would like to speak to the item? Councillor Loden? Just a, a quick comment. Um, there's been a lot of debate and emails and so forth back and forth, but just wanted to draw people's attention to uh, 5.2, that administration we're reviewing the operational guidelines used to determine intervention to reduce road speed. So currently we have this measure that says 85% um, is the threshold. Um, I apologise to everybody to talk about statistics, but I will do it anyway. 85% um, represents roughly one standard deviation above the norm, um, and that's why we have 15% um, of traffic that is travelling beyond that. Uh, we, we know from the briefing report that the standard deviation of this is about 9 kilometres an hour, so two standard deviations, if the speed is 50 k's an hour at one standard deviation is 59 kilometres an hour at two standard deviations, and it means that even at that point you're still talking about 2.5% of the traffic travelling faster than nine kilometres over the speed limit. Um, and I hope that through this review, uh, administration is able to come up with some kind of measure to address that, what is going on in that 
fifteen percent above uh, whatever the 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 eighty five percentile is because we don't know if those are people travelling at fifty one k's an hour or seventy k's an hour and it makes a very big difference for safety on our streets whether uh, which of those two items we're actually dealing with so uh, look forward to seeing what administration comes up with and um, as promised, I did not ask you a question about statistics. We love statistics, Councillor Loden. <laughs> Councillors, anything further? Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, just a, a question. I probably should have asked it during the amendment debate. Um, the substantive now reads at 3.2 um, a mid block single lane snow, slow point instead of changing the on-road parking. Uh, just a question about what um, has prompted that change and is that the same configuration that we're proposing for Claverton Street? Director? Yeah, through you, Presiding Member. That's correct. It's the same configuration we're proposing in the other street. And uh, there was quite a lot of communication saying that uh, flipping the parking, although it was um, a common sense and low cost solution, it would only be effective when people were parking there. And so there was some concern that there wasn't always parking there. So it wouldn't um, work in, in the way it should. So a, a slow point will mean it'll work 100% of the time. Anything further, Councillor Castle? Okay, look, I just wanted to speak briefly on the substantive, just to say I think this is actually a really interesting body of work. We've put classifiers on the road and we've gathered a whole bunch of data around speed, traffic volumes, the number of commercial vehicles um, at a single point in time. It's not been my experience um, to date that we have um, actually taken that approach and I think it's a really sound approach going forward to look at parking um, in not just in um, st you know, one or two streets where we've had issues raised from residents, but obviously in the surrounding streets, in the neighbourhood, because uh, it allows us to, I guess, perhaps attempt to model the traffic flows and anticipate and uh, estimate behaviour of the uh, and, and driving routes of the vehicles that are travelling on those streets and then also to um, understand the likelihood of the impact of intervention. So I think this is really good data. I'm pleased that uh, the response to the petition now essentially um, delivers what the residents were requesting, which is a neighbourhood level approach and also engagement with the community. So I'm very happy um, to move forward with this one. If there's nothing further, I'll put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We'll now move on to item 9.3, number one, Muriel Place in Leaderville, proposed alterations and additions to a single house. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Loden. Councillor Toppelberg? Uh, nothing to add. Glad the cottage is being kept. Sensitive uh, design. Happy to support the officer recommendation. Councillor Loden? Um, I agree. I'm also happy to see that uh, the mitigations around the rear trees is included in there as well. Although they aren't required as a condition of the approval, that will help to address some of the concerns that are raised by neighbours as well. Councillors? OK, I'll put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're now moving on to item 9.1. Number 73 slash 288 Lord Street Highgate, change of use from shop to unlisted use cigar bar. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Council moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Toppleberg. Councillor Hallett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I've got a couple of concerns and also a question. Um, in terms of some of my concerns about this application, there's the undersupply of parking, which I think others might speak to um, tonight, and also the change of use to a premises that's highly restrictive in who can utilise it, and it's unclear what benefit it will provide the local community. I'm also a bit concerned about the inconsistency with our public health plan, which refers to the importance of tobacco cessation and the provision of smoke-free environments, uh, but inconsistency with other city policy in itself isn't actually a planning consideration for our purposes. Um, there was a mention in the public gallery about um, compliance with Tobacco Products Control Act um, and I understand that we've received legal advice that this use would not be deemed a public place under the Act, um, but it will be a workplace under occupational safety and health legislation. 
That legislation prohibits smoking by employers and employees in an enclosed workplace, but these employees will still be exposed to some secondhand smoke, even if they choose to do that themselves, from clients of the premises, regardless of the air filtering that's taking place. The legislation is pretty explicit in saying that employees must not be exposed to hazards. If in the case that we approve this um, application and WorkSafe does end up getting involved, do we retain any residue liability for the OSH impacts on employees? Through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, what Council is being asked to consider tonight is an application for development approval. Um, whilst we are acknowledging the occupational health and safety implications, I would not be of the view that we would be liable for any uh, work safe uh, investigation to take place at a later date. All right, thanks for that. Um, I just want to touch on air filtration then. Um, there's a wide range of airborne particles that arise out of the combustion of tobacco products, including cigars. Secondhand smoke is a complex mixture of over 4,000 chemical compounds and particulate matter that are damaging to human health. That includes at least 250 constituents that are toxic to the central nervous system, immune system, the heart and the liver, and cause eye, skin and respiratory problems, plus another 59 carcinogens. When we're talking about uh, airborne particles, there's a large range. There's those that are greater than 10 microns that we don't have a lot of public health concern about because they're filtered out through the nose, cilia, the little hairs in our nose, and the mucus of the respiratory tract. But below 10 microns is when it gets a little bit more interesting and a bit more harmful. So particulate matter less than 10 microns is considered coarse. It can generally be filtered effectively due to their larger size. There's also what's called fine particulates, which are less than 2.5 microns, and they too can be filtered generally effectively. But when we get to those that are below 0.1 microns, these are called ultrafine or nanoparticles. These are also the hardest to filter, and as it happens, tobacco smoke particles frequently fall into that category. These smaller particles can penetrate deeper into the lungs, resulting in higher toxicity through oxidative stress and inflammation, and can also pass into the bloodstream, causing serious health problems. So why is that important, though, if the report states the proposed air filtration system will remove 99.97% of airborne particles before releasing clean air back into the premises? It's important because the 99.97% is a measure of mass. So the filter will indeed filter a large majority of airborne particulates by weight. But because the larger ones are heavier and the smaller ones are harder to filter, far more of these get retained in the air. And I'd like to emphasise in particular, when it comes to these smaller ultrafine particles, many of them have no threshold at which they are not considered a health risk. So as outlined by admin in the report, there will absolutely be tobacco smoke released from the vent from this premise regardless of the filtering. That exhaust will contain these substances. It's also been confirmed by admin by email in response to questions that the Australian standards that are being stipulated for the placement events are generic standards that apply, for example, to commercial kitchens and have not been developed for the release of concentrated tobacco smoke emissions. Secondhand smoke does transfer through multi-unit housing via walls, ductwork, windows and ventilation systems, not to mention via open-air apartment balconies. So this is an unlisted use and we're being asked to use our discretion on that use. It's my opinion that this application poses a health risk to neighbouring residents, not to mention those who use the establishment, that that reduced air quality is a direct reduction in amenity for those living in the above apartments. And on that basis, I won't be supporting the officers of recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Hallett. Councillor Toppleboe. Thank you. Um, first thing I'll do is move the amendment that's on the purple, which relates to cash in loot. And if I can get a seconder for it, I'll speak to it. Move to Councillor Toppleberg, second, and Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Uh, regardless of what happens with this application, I haven't seen, and I do accept the officer's comment, uh, well, that they have no objection, rather no obligation, uh, to the uh, proposed to the proposed uh, condition uh, in relation to cash in lieu. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen anything that supports uh, the long-term cumulative effect of uh, reduced car parking within the area. I think that the availability the the parking management plan uh, indicates that there may may be sufficient car parking currently, but I, the, the argument against cash and loo hasn't been made uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, so I'm uh, comfortable with that condition. I'll speak to the item um, after, the, after the amendment is determined. Councillor Murphy. Yeah, look, I agree with Councillor Toppleberg. I think that um, 
you know, it's fair and reasonable given all the other bars and premises um, that we've charged cash in lieu over the years that um, this bar also incurs um, that, or has that contribution. So happy to support the amendment. Councillors? I'll, look, I'll just speak on this briefly. Yes, I'm supportive of this amendment. I feel that um, the case needs to be made that the um, public parking and public transport is going to be applicable for the life of the development as the local area densifies and we see increasing use of the um, uh, train station car park through um, increasing use of the stadium and um, surrounding developments. I, I don't believe the case has been made uh, that the development is able to the parking associated with the development is able to be accommodated on nearby residential streets um, for the life of the development and so uh, I, I support the amendment to require the, uh, make the applicant to make a cash in their contribution to the city for the shortfall of safe parking base. If there's nothing further, I will put the amendment. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll leave the uh, public health debate or otherwise to the side. I, I do think that there, you know, there is legislation. We're talking about the land use, and there is legislation that covers the uh, the um, operation of uh, a private member's facility that enables people to smoke within it. I don't quite understand it, but that's not my job here. My job here is to determine the land use, and so I'm happy for others to... Uh, engage in that debate. For me, the clause in our scheme which allows this to be approved or refused, uh, which refers to the use, says that there are three options available to us for an unlisted use. Option one is we determine it's consistent with the objectives. Option two is we determine it may be consistent and we go out to consultation and try and gauge that from community. And option number three is we determine it's not consistent and uh, we outright uh, refuse it. So uh, my assumption, and I won't ask the question, is that option number two was the opinion of the officers that it was uh, that it may be consistent, and it therefore uh, we gave notice under clause 64 of the deemed provisions. Um, for me, and there is some comment in the report, which is brief, which uh, in, in relation to that, we, the report goes at length to talk about the proposed management plan, to talk about uh, the applications for membership, the way in which people will enter and exit the building, uh, all of those uh, matters which relate to the operation of it. Um, <coughs> Then, but within the report in relation to it being consistent with the objectives, the officers have commented uh, it's consistent with the LPS2 objectives for commercial zone which states to facilitate a wide range of compatible commercial uses. My personal opinion is that a ground floor tenancy uh, in an emerging area to have it effectively as a closed private members club which requires the uh, submission of a CV to even be considered for membership is not consistent with what I would say the objectives uh, of that zone and that location. Uh, and for me, as I say, the public health matters aside, the uh, proposed land use doesn't, uh, for the unlisted use, uh, doesn't is not consistent with the scheme in my view. So on that basis, I won't be supporting the officer recommendation. Councillors, Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, presiding member, I have a question. Uh, but before I ask that question, I have a question about my question. Uh, it relates to the item, a confidential attachment and whether we can ask questions about that in public gallery or, or public meeting or whether we need to be behind closed doors to ask a question about a confidential attachment. CEO, perhaps you could provide some advice in relation to Councillor Castle's question. Uh, forgive me, presiding member. I'm just looking on the listed attachments 1 to 10 in the officer report. Uh, none of those attachments are stated as confidential attachments. Is it material that was circulated to council members only with the briefing notes that's being requested? It's uh, it's marked confidential attachment item 9.1288 Lord Street. It's a letter from the State Solicitor's Office. Uh, through you, presiding member, I'll just have to ask if the uh, acting director can maybe bring me a copy of it if he's got one or, or perhaps show it to me or something.
Um, through you, Presiding Member, apologies for the delay. Um, I would say, in short, Council Members, no, that wouldn't be appropriate for two reasons. Firstly, um, it relates to correspondence um, for which the City was not the intended recipient. And secondly, it's uh, legal advice that's uh, labelled very clearly as private and, and legally privileged uh, from the State Solicitor's Office, and as a consequence, it would not be appropriate to discuss the content of that letter um, in open council session. Um, notwithstanding, given the general nature of the advice, um, if there are any particular questions that council members have that relate to the officer comments or advice about the tobacco control legislation or other requirements, um, that are referenced in the report, then you're welcome to uh, direct your comments and questions to the statements that officers have made in the report. Councillor Castle. Can I have a think about that and can not go to someone else? Councillors. Look, I'll take the opportunity to briefly speak on this matter. Um, I echo the sentiments of Councillor Toppelberg in relation to the land use, uh, the change of use that we are considering this evening. I uh, do not accept that the uh, proposed development is compatible with the adjacent commercial uses or the commercial uses in the area, and I feel that there is a potential loss of community benefit f resulting from the change in land use. I, there, uh, there could be a community benefit from a shop or other development that would be lost with the, um, if the private club was approved. Councillor Castle. Through you, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to um, ask a, make a few comments to allow Councillor Castle to um, collect her thoughts. Um, just, um, I concur with um, all the comments made by the councillors, um, and I will delve into the health aspects that Councillor Hallett um, has made. I, I do accept the information that he's put before us. There's obviously a comment in here um, from one of the nearby residents that say they could smell the restaurant smells that came out of there. I, I just, I do believe that it will affect the amenity of residents within that building and potentially the um, residents um, or users of the buildings behind. My concern too is about the amenity of a um, ground floor um, complex where it is swipe card entrance and um, essentially it's a private club. Um, I'm not sure what they intend to do with the windows but I, I'm also not sure that we would want to have um, you know, up to 60, there's up to 62 people which includes two staff within that um, cigar bar when it's at maximum capacity. Um, as the, you know, as the use for that particular building, I just don't think it's in keeping with what, um, with what we would expect from a ground floor building. So um, I will not be supporting the officer's recommendation, and I would happily support the alternative recommendation, which is on our desk. Councillor Cass. All right, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, my question really is, is the, the document that was provided to us in the briefing notes, is that the basis for the conclusion that this um, premises or this proposed use would not fall under the definition of a public place? Uh, and I guess I have some questions around the date of that advice and, and the ongoing relevance without going... Director. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, that legal advice uh, did in fact form part of the basis for arriving at the conclusion that the site was not a public place for the purpose of the Tobacco Products Control Act. That information was effectively confirmed by a gentleman from the gallery earlier, earlier this evening. Whilst the date of that legal advice uh, is some years old, um, the advice is still seemingly relevant. Oh, can Councillor I ask Hullis? a supplementary question then, following from um, Councillor Castle? Um, without um, obviously referring directly to that document, my understanding is that document is dated 2006. Is that correct? Um, so my question is, to, through you, Presiding Officer, to the Director, what did you do, Director, to find out whether that legal advice which, as we know, legal advice does change over time um, in, rea in response to court cases, in response to precedents, in regards to a whole range of things, 
and I'm somebody I deal with the SSO on a very regular basis um, over a long period of time and I've seen lots of change legal advice so my question is what did you do to ascertain whether that legal advice is still valid and, con and contemporary uh, given that that was the basis upon which the officer's recommendation was made uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, administration did actually, in fact, review the tobacco products control regulations and was able to confirm that the provisions cited in the legal advice were the same as the provisions as they exist today. Councillor Hart, anything further? Yes, CEO, you would like to ask a question? Yep. Um, through you, Presiding Member, just as a point of clarification to the Acting Director as an extension to Councillor Harley's question, which um, hopefully the, the answer will provide a little bit of clarity. Um, given that the reference to whether or not uh, the premises is or is not deemed a public building actually falls under the Health Act and the Health Public Building Regs, as opposed to the tobacco control legislation and regulation, it would be worthwhile if uh, the director could just clarify or confirm for council the assessment or evaluation that was undertaken by administration to reach the conclusion that under that health legislation and, and related public buildings regs that the building is not a public building or the, proposed, the premises and the nature to which it's proposed to be used um, is not deemed a public building because that is entirely separate to and unrelated for the most part, to the tobacco control legislation. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, apologies for the, uh, the confusion. Uh, under the Tobacco Products Control Act and the Tobacco Products Control Regulations, the subject site is not a public place. However, for the purposes of the Health Act and the Associated Health Regulations, it is a public building. So there's two separate uh, sets of legislation and regulation. In one case, it is not a public place, but in the other case, it is a public building. Again, apologies for the confusion. Councillors, anything further? Councillor Hallett. Um, given that we've got a, a new Public Health Act, can you just talk about the implications for new regulations and as they get rolled out um, and what relevance they might have to it as well? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, as with any new legislation and regulation, as they are rolled out and enacted, it would be incumbent upon staff and council to have due regard to those provisions in making any decision uh, on application for development approval. Anything further? Okay. Uh, Councillor Hallett, do you need write a reply? <coughs> Sure. I just, I guess, I, I would echo, I guess, some of the comments from the public gallery. Also, um, agree with Councillor uh, Gondoszewski and uh, Toppelberger in terms of the active use stuff. Um, I think when we've got down um, ground floor uses in an area that is primed for a lot of redevelopment in terms of the Claysbrook area, um, we want as much activation as possible. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's compatible with that. In terms of the objectives for the local planning scheme number two, it's pretty explicit in my interpretation of it that health and wellbeing of community is part of considerations. Um, and so for that reason, I, I do draw a really strong link in terms of public health implications and the amenity um, of the local area. Um, and just in terms of the new Public Health Act, it's one of the main drivers for the new Public Health Act is applying more of a risk analysis and a precautionary principle to um, public health issues rather than responding to them. And so I'd really hope that we can uh, apply a precautionary principle to this uh, case as well. OK. If there's nothing further, I will put the item. All those in favour and against? That's, uh, the item is... Uh, Lost. Um, I believe there is a alternative. Councillor Hallett, did you wish to move the alternative? Yep. Do I have a second of the alternative, Councillor Hallett? Councillor Hallett. 
Uh, thank you. Um, the alternative recommendation is for a refusal of the application um, based on a, a number of reasons. Um, one, the proposed development by virtue of inadequate ultrafine particle filtration will potentially have an unacceptably detrimental impact on the personal health of surrounding residents. Perhaps not noise, as ours might have. Um, having due consideration for the objectives of the mixed-use zone and Clause 67N of Schedule 2 of the Planning and Development Local Planning Schemes Regulations 2015, the proposed development is not considered compatible with its setting due to the potential amenity impacts on nearby residents resulting from the discharge of tobacco smoke from the subject site. And three, the proposed development in providing only two dedicated bays for up to 62 visitors is not considered to meet the objectives of Council's policy um, regarding parking requirements. Um, it may be that there's some amendments suggested from the um, from Council around some extra um, points in there in terms of some of that amenity. Councillor Harley? No, I have nothing further. Councillors? Councillor Toppelberg? Questions for you to the Acting Director. Uh, in terms of the scheme, given that it's an unlisted use, uh, just in so um, proposed clause two deals with uh, uh, with the regulations uh, about the about the objectives um, of the mixed use zone, but gives specific reasons that relate to public health concerns. Is it? incumbent upon Council to provide any reasons other than its Council's view that it is not consistent with the objectives of the particular zone? Because my understanding from this, uh, the reason I ask is that Clause 18.4c of the scheme just says that we can determine that use is not consistent with the objectives of a particular zone and therefore not permitted. Do we need to be specific about why we believe that it's not consistent with the objectives of the zone? Director. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, it would be good practice to identify the reasons why, you've, why you, why Council, in this instance, considers it is not consistent with the objectives of the zone. Uh, those reasons are effectively captured in proposed uh, reason number two, uh, so I think that would be satisfactory. Oh, sorry, Councillor Topperberg, anything further? Councillors. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a question following on from the comments of councillors in the debate um, and from Councillor Topperberg's question. I'm wondering whether it would be, in an abundance of caution, be worth identifying the second reason for this not being compatible, and that relates to the loss of amenity uh, to residents from the uh, exclusive use that, that was discussed, and whether they're we should be crafting something to add to clause number two. Councillor Castle, did you want commentary from the director or did you want to craft an amendment? <laughs> I would like him to craft it. <laughs> director, um, would you provide some advice on the appropriate wording for a possible amendment to item two? Through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, proposed reason two could be supplemented uh, following the words discharge of tobacco smoke from the subject site. Uh, it could be supplemented with, as well as facilitating a development which provides an insufficient, well, provides insufficient activity at street level. which would have a detrimental impact on the prevailing streetscape. Councillor Castle, did you wish to move that as an amendment? Yes, I will. Is there a seconder? Councillor Hallett? Councillor Castle, did you wish to speak? Councillor Hallett? Anything further? No, I'll put the amendment to amend item 2 to say that uh, after the, the word smoke from the subject site, um, as it would insert, as well as facilitating a development which provides um, insufficient 
activation at street level, which would result in a loss of amenity. I'm sorry, we got it up on the screen. Three. Madam Presiding Member. Councillor Toffelberg. Just for clarity, uh, would, would it perhaps be in the interest for, for clarity for Council and also for potentially where this may end up if those two reasons were listed as 2A and 2B? Um, so that we had, after the words due to, A, the potential amenity, etc., and B, facilitation of a development that has so that there are two separate reasons listed rather than a continuous sentence? Perhaps. Look, I'm all for appropriate setting up. Councillor Castle, your thoughts as the mover of the amendment? I'm on board with that plan. And uh, Councillor Hallett, yes. Given that we've asked for a mover and seconder, am I able to ask a question at this time or is that not allowed whilst we're waiting for the actual motion to be tabled? I feel we're waiting formatting at this point in time. Councillor Toppelberg, proceed with your question. So my question is either to the CEO or to the Acting Director. Um, with the help of our... Uh, well, I've, I'm just looking uh, on the Health Department's website and it's a, it's a question, and I ask the question at this point because it may inform a further reason potentially for refusal. And forgive me for reading. This is a question, but I'm just going to read from the website. So this comes from the Department of Health. I know we've had a, a comment made from the gallery from a gentleman who works for, for said department, but just it says, is smoking permitted during private functions or in private guest rooms? Yes, an enclosed public space used exclusively for private functions to which attendance is by invitation only is not considered a public place. Perfectly clear. He goes on to say, public places include places to which the public or a section of the public, such as members of a sporting club, whether on payment or money, for example membership fees, or due to their membership of a club or group have access. Therefore, functions held by clubs, associations or other similar groups for their members are not private functions. If these functions are held in enclosed public spaces, smoking is not permitted. For me, that provides ambiguity as to the definition of public place. I'm, uh, the question that I have is whether the licence that has been issued to the uh, proposed business gives a definitive answer to that, in that they wouldn't have been able to have that licence issued. I know that I understand it's for the sale of tobacco products. But has that question been, by issue of that licence, has that question been resolved by, under the Liquor Control Act? Or if I feel there's ambiguity in relation to what is the current information available, is that a reasonable uh, further reason to, to add as a reason for refusing the application? Director. Uh, through Deputy Mayor, uh, in terms of the licence that has recently been issued by the Department of Health to Cigar Social Proprietary Limited, 
that is simply a licence to sell tobacco products, so that doesn't provide any clarification one way or another regarding the ability to consume the products on site. Uh, in terms of the previously mentioned legal advice, um, a series of scenario, hypothetical scenarios were contained within the legal advice, uh, one of which was very, very similar to the application we have on hand, and for that reason, administration are of the view that uh, for the purposes of the Tobacco Products Control Act and the Tobacco Products Control Regulations, uh, this site is not a public place and therefore there is no impediment to uh, members smoking within that facility. Councillor Toppelberg, did you wish to... No, you can't amend an amendment. We've got to uh, vote on the amendment. Councillor Lowden. Um, just a clarification, I believe it was uh, Councillor Castle who proposed the amendment, not uh, Councillor Toppelberg. That's correct. So, but before Councillor Toppelberg could choose to put forward an amendment, we need to vote on this amendment. So, oh, it's for, on the... Thank you. Could we please amend to... Yep. OK, nothing further on the amendment? I will put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Toppelberg, did you wish to put forward a further amendment? I won't, but I'll speak to the substantive. Uh, so uh, I actually struggled with this one because I think that, in principle, a business that is legally allowed to exist our role as council is not to stand in their way in terms of the land use. If there is legislation surrounding the operation of that business, I think that's a place for uh, whether it be, and uh, Councillor Hallett indeed asked the question about uh, the rights of workers or otherwise, and I think that there is legislation that adequately covers that. Uh, I, the only thing I will note, and I'll say it, uh, I won't amend the recommendation, but I do think that there is some ambiguity around the definition uh, under the current advice, given that it explicitly, what's explicitly stated on the website. The reason I won't propose an amendment is that I can't refer directly to the clause in the Act that would lead me to that, and I think that that's, if this ends up uh, somewhere where lawyers are looking at it, I'd rather have that information in there. But to me, I'm not necessarily convinced that it, uh, that it, it fits the doesn't fit the definition of a public place. Um, that aside, I respect uh, people's rights to apply for uh, a, a, a business. I do not think that this is appropriate in this uh, place. And I also think that if council is of a view that a uh, venue in which, uh, whether it be a uh, tobacconist or a smoking lounge or otherwise is, is a use that we want to specifically list as a prohibited use, there are opportunities for us to amend the scheme and we can do so accordingly. And I think that would uh, be a path that we would would or should consider going forward so that the ambiguity is removed both for the applicant and for the city. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillors? Councillor Hallett? Do you want to reply? OK, I will put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We will now move on to item 9.4, number 3, Bulwer Avenue, Perth, existing and proposed alterations to single house. May I have a mover and a seconder for this item, please? Moved, Councillor Toppelberg. Seconded, Councillor Lowden. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, and I know that the length of time that took up until now is probably not contributing any further to Justin's angst, so <laughs> apologies for the, the processes. Look, I, I've got some fairly strong views on this and I respect the fact that this is, called, this is somebody's home and a significant investment and it's causing, has caused and may continue to cause significant angst and that is understood and respected absolutely. Um, done a bit of, and this wasn't tonight, this was uh, earlier, but I had done a little bit of looking around to see uh, about the genesis of this and what information has been available. I understand that um, the applicant has made the submission on the basis of advice that was provided and particularly provided by the State Heritage Office and I respect that that advice that was given not only was true and accurate but led them down a path uh, that has resulted in the, the works being undertaken. And I guess the, that's how that has occurred is understood but that's largely not our responsibility as the regulator and what for me 
the reason we have uh, the municipal heritage inventory and the reason why we, uh, the state and local government recognises that there is a hierarchy and that there, is, there are places that are of significance to a community for different reasons uh, and the MHI in itself is enshrined within our scheme is for this very reason that you can have properties or groups of properties that are of significance to a community but don't quite meet a threshold for state significance and that's what we have here. Um, I did and I, again I apologise if this seems a bit Odd, but I know that the, some of what the uh, I suppose the the issue that's been raised is about the financial implications of uh, what it may mean to uh, to rectify some of the works. But I did go back and look at the original listing of the property, um, and I'll read for it. in one line. It says, "Why so cheap? Royal Inn has some issues and needs lots of love, but sensibly priced to reflect this." Now that's I have no idea what the property sold for. That's not my issue or concern. But I guess in the original listing, and if the agent didn't point out that this was on our municipal heritage inventory, that is something for the applicant to take up with the agent. But I guess that flags to me that from the outset there was an indication that this property needed careful love and attention in terms of some of the issues with the property itself. Uh, there is no mention in the listing, I must say, uh, of its listing on the, um, on the MHI, but I, I guess to me that would flag as a potential buyer that there are questions that need to be asked. Uh, I, uh, I've been past the property. I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with the street. I uh, think there are, that you can make a subjective argument about colour, about render, about other things, but for me this is about why we have our MHI and the reason why we list properties. I was in the chamber when this group of properties was listed. Uh, I was in the chamber when numbers one and I th the other end, which I think is 19, were removed. Uh, um, and we all saw what came at the properties that were built at that, that, uh, the other end in its place. Um, which caused great distress to the people on the street and uh, certainly to me as somebody who put up my hand to allow it to be removed at the time. Um, but I guess what is heritage... For me, I look at this and think, well, what does heritage listing mean? And for me, if we can't... If we are protecting the property and its place within the street uh, and we'll leave the other two rendered properties to the side, but if we're protecting that, it's, it's the way it faces to the street. And so... Uh, my feelings are certainly if someone said it's going to cost 40 grand to remove the render on the front, I think you need to look for somebody else to perhaps look at doing that. I've been through a process of removing cement render from an, an old uh, home myself and uh, had uh, a variety of different brickwork that was discovered underneath it. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's not an easy task, but for me, the face of that building is what contributes to its heritage value within that streetscape. And so uh, I note that there is an amendment that has been prepared on the orange, which effectively, so um, I will move that amendment, which effectively uh, specifies that the, it effectively says exactly as per the officer recommendation, uh, but it approves the rendering on the side elevations of the dwelling, so it le leaves the sides as they are, uh, but it requires the uh, front external walls and the two chimney stacks uh, to have the rendering removed. So I will move that amendment, if I may. Uh, Councillor Topperberg, is there a seconder for the amendment on the orange? Councillor Lowden seconded. Councillor Topperberg? Um, you know, I mean, the, uh, again, I understand the, um, the applicant's point about uh, consistency or otherwise with the, what was the existing painted, painted brickwork at the front uh, and the, uh, well, largely unserviceable uh, chimney, we'll, we'll call it that. But at the end of the day, the property... Uh, was purchased uh, as a heritage listed property. I think uh, there may be, uh, in the event that this is, a, this is approved as, uh, as it currently reads, there may be uh, some uh, argument or negotiation uh, between the, the council and the applicant in relation to the chimney. I think that that is perhaps something separate but not something that can be resolved in the chamber. Uh, but for me, the way that this property was finished at the point at which it uh, was listed on the heritage inventory with that ex with the, uh, whilst it was painted over with the limestone and brickwork was a critical part of its contribution to the fabric of the streetscape uh, and that's something that I think is worthy of fighting to retain and as I say that, that the, the heritage listing of the street largely relied on that consistency uh, or that, that pattern of development that existed at the time of the listing uh, across the streetscape so for that reason I, I, I'm not so passionate about the sides of the building. There may be some heritage gurus out there who say they're one and the same, but I think that that's a fair outcome uh, given where we're at at this current point. Councillor Lowden. Councillors. 
Uh, look, I'll just say, I'll just note um, in relation to this that we've, in reviewing the heritage impact statement, it does note that um, that retaining the render on the uh, side elevations of the building has a limited potential to impact on the presentation to Bull Avenue uh, and also noting that there are several other re dwellings in the group that have uh, rendered side elevations. So look, I'm supportive of the amendment. If there's nothing further, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're now back to the substantive. Sorry, is it... Councillor Lowden. I don't think there's a whole lot more I can add, so I'll leave it there. Councillor Harley. Um, I've got a number of questions arising from um, questions that Justin asked from the gallery, um, and also, um, obviously, through you, presiding officer, to the director. So I want to address the issue about the other houses in the street, um, which were alluded to as having <coughs> render. So I'd like to... I've got a series of questions. Would you like them all at once, or do you want me to ask them one by one? Jack, do your preference? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, I'm happy to take them one by one. OK. So I'm um, wanting to have that issue addressed. Um, it is not... Um, it is not a rare thing um, that where somebody um, has been brought to task um, on a compliance matter that they point out a whole range of other areas which are non... Compliant. I note that this came into us from an anonymous complaint rather than something our officers um, had seen. So my question is, what what happens to the other houses on the street which have render which is not approved if they too are MHI or state heritage listed? What what do you propose to do? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, based on uh, the applicant's assertions last week, staff um, investigated uh, a number of sites uh, along Bulwer Avenue and at least two were found to have um, render applied. Um, a, a review of the council records did not find any development approvals for that render, so it will now be a case of administration um, contacting the owners in a not too dissimilar similar fashion to the way the applicant was uh, approached in, on this occasion uh, with a view to having the works rectified or have an application lodged for the development that was undertaken with that development approval. Thank you. And through you, Presiding Officer, can I just um, <coughs> clear up? Um, I'm a bit confused. Is the home heritage listed on the State Heritage Register or isn't it? There seems to have been advice given out from the office it was referred to as being um, state heritage listed, but our records show it's only MHI. Are you able to clarify that on the record? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the site is not included on the state register, but is certainly included on the in the city's heritage frameworks. So my question is, um, for <clears throat> if somebody purchases a home which is MH, uh, on the MHI, um, and they seek to have it taken off the MHI, or in this case, after having a compliance notice issued, how are they able to do that? So can compliance action in this case, could that cause an owner to take a home off the MHI? And would they avoid the compliance action which was already in place? Uh, through Deputy Mayor, there are avenues under the uh, planning regulations to add or remove a site from a heritage list, a scheme heritage list. Um, there is a formal process to go through which involves consultation with affected landowners and surrounding residents and decision of council. If it were to be in this case um, that council did not approve all of the existing works and therefore rendered, pardon the pun, therefore uh, cause the uh, parts of the application to remain unapproved, if the applica applicant then sought to exercise their right to have the site removed from the heritage list, it would still be open to council to undertake compliance and enforcement action for the development that was undertaken without approval at the time. Sorry, just a point of clarification where you said about exercising their right. MHI Category 1, does it not require a decision of council to be able to remove 
the site from the lease. It's not just that the category B is the owner's right. Category one or category A, my understanding is that the, it has to, it's a decision of council to remove it. Uh, through Deputy Mayor, for clarification, when I said the owner's right, that was to make an application. Uh, the decision certainly rests with the council. Okay. Um, look, I'm a bit torn with this one because I do not too that there were um, there was communication with the owner to cease work and um, by the by the my reading of the report work continued and in fact a paint um, was then applied to the render but and there is no doubt that the house is in far better condition um, than than what it was at the time of sale and so that's a you know that's a positive for the street it's a positive it's a positive for the house. Um, and I, um, I understand it was painted over the tuck point. Um, the tuck point was painted over in its original form when it was sold. So there was the tuck point brickwork itself was not visible. It was painted over. Is that correct, Director? Through you, Deputy Mayor, yes, that's correct. So can I just ask, had the, I'm just curious, because this is not the only time this is going to arise, had the owner done nothing other than repaint what was already in existence, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Is it only because render has been applied, or, or, or if the owner had done nothing other than stabilise the premises? Just trying to understand how it got to this, this point. Uh, through Deputy Mayor, the city's heritage management policy effectively sets out what works are exempt from the requirement to obtain development approval and what works are not. As a, uh, I suppose, a broad response, if the works are simply to replace like for like and are general maintenance and upkeep, that would generally not require development approval. But if it is going to change the, I suppose, the underlying heritage fa fabric of the site, or in some other way, fundamentally change uh, the nature of the building, uh, in this case, the application of render that wasn't otherwise there, that would obviously require development approval. Anything further, Councillor Harley? Councillors? Okay, look, I'll just speak briefly. Um, look, I, I acknowledge the, um, the, the work that's been undertaken to date to uh, restore um, elements of the, the home and, uh, and echo Councillor Harley's um, commentary in relation that the condition of the home is, is largely improved. Uh, I can't reconcile this with the um, placement of render on the front facade. Absolutely on the sides, I think, you know, we have to be somewhat pragmatic about this. Um, however, uh, reading the um, uh, report, uh, the, the structure report, uh, an, an assessment of the uh, porch, um, it didn't at the time note um, significant structural defects to the, to the brickwork on the porch. Um, and I, I can appreciate that the uh, applicant has also stated in the response that some of the brickwork was repaired prior to the render being applied. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, that the uh, render to the front can be uh, worked to be removed um, and that we can see the original facade revealed. I guess I have, I do have a question. Um, I note that the heritage impact statement does reference um, the removal of the render as a potential risk to the, uh, I guess, the brickwork and the, 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 uh, the structure uh, and uh, just would appreciate advice on what um, the process would be should the um, removal uh, cause significant damage to the brickwork um, is uh, 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 if, uh, whether there is a, a way forward from that point um, should there be an evidence of demonstration of removal etc. Uh, through you Deputy Mayor um, the advice received from the city thus far or city staff thus far is that whilst there might be some limited damage um, to the original fabric as a result of the remediation works, um, given the likely limited nature of that, um, it would be able to be repaired through tuck pointing or replacement of specific bricks with new or recycled face bricks, um, so as to effectively match the existing fabric of the building. If the remediation works led to more significant damage, it would be open to the applicant to effectively 
revisit or re-lodge or lodge a new application for development approval, which, again, under the the, the council's heritage management policy, um, would interpret the situation differently on the basis that if the works were, if the situation was irretrievable from a structural integrity point of view, council would have to have regard to that in terms of making its decision about what works would be required. But the advice we've received, um, effectively from plasterers and stonemasons that specialise in this field, is that the damage is likely to be limited. Thank you, Director. And just one further, just um, in relation to um, Justin's comments around, I think, I believe it was ceilings and some of the gutters, can I just confirm that the um, motion that is being considered now, uh, the uh, really the that all of the uh, um, items from the approved plans and written submission, with the exception of the um, street facade and, and chimney render, and perhaps elements associated with the the, the actual facade fronting um, Bulwer Street, that they are under this um, motion are to be approved. At uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, yes, that's correct. Um, with the amendment contained on the orange form, if that was in fact passed, Council would be approving the bulk of the works uh, and all that would be left unapproved is effectively the front facade treatment. And we have approved that. So, we're on this, the, so um, Yeah, so, okay, so that essentially that it is all that's required is um, that the only uh, compliance action would relate to the render at the front. Okay, thank you very much. Councillors, is there anything further? Councillor Toppelberg? All right, I will put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. All right, thank you. We'll now move to the items that Council has called out for debate. The first being um, item 10.3, trees located on private property, consideration of introducing a limited local law to impose obligations on an owner to prune trees overhanging a neighbour's property. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item? Councillor Toppelberg seconded. Councillor Loden. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, so this relates to... Uh, a notice of motion, which the genesis of which is really uh, an ongoing issue, I suppose, and it's it's an issue with a particular property that I'm aware of that has, uh, I, I guess, has asked questions that had wider city citywide ramifications. I accept uh, the um, I accept the reasons that are provided uh, within or the the discussion that's provided within the report, but I will ask a question of the director, if I may. Um, the, essentially, if somebody, if there is a tree that overhangs, that is over your boundary, so there are limbs of the tree that are uh, intruding onto your property in any airspace, you have a right to, uh, actually, can you explain what your rights are in terms of, uh, as, as a property owner, in terms of that tree, and what happens to the uh, to what you are potentially able to cut as well. Uh, through you, presiding member. Um, you, you, I think we, we had this discussion early. Um, you are entitled as a, as a neighbour to cut an overhanging branch back to the property line if it overhangs your property, and you're entitled to do the same thing with a tree root, so in, dig up the tree root back to the boundary or the fence line of your property. So that, that's the entitlement that you have. And uh, if we assume that the basis for being allowed to do that is that it's considered to be an intrusion into your property, whether it be enjoyment of or otherwise, but it's considered, at what point is, is that, and that, that's covered under, that's covered under council legislation, or under uh, local law that relates to council, is that correct? 
I'm looking at the CEO, but um, just in case he has something to add. But my understanding, that's civil law, so that's common law, and that's so, uh, an entitlement of, a, of an owner. So that relates to, and at what point upwards does that cease to exist? At what point is the airspace above your... So uh, where I'm getting to is if you have a tree that is growing and you are trimming the limbs, but eventually there are limbs that require a ladder, cherry picker, crane or otherwise to be able to access it, at what point vertically is, is, is the law silent on it? I mean, I it's at some point you don't own the airspace above your property, but at what point uh, are you able to legally just cut it on the basis of the civil law? Um, through you, presiding member, sorry, I'm <laughs> not intending to hijack the response. Um, the, the, as far as I'm aware, and you know, saving getting specific legal advice as to whether or not you can go into the stratosphere, um, the simple advice that the director provided is, um, as far as all of my experience says, what is the entitlement? So whether it's two metres above the fence line or 20 metres above the fence line, um, if the tree is overhanging into your property, then you have the entitlement to remove it. Um, through you, presiding member, I'm kind of anticipating that there might be a follow-up query to that along the lines that if if the neighbour who was so affected um, consequently had to incur costs to exercise those rights to trim back the tree as they are entitled to do, then um, what recourse do they have? And quite simply, they have recourse by taking the matter to court. Um, there is a, um, a helpful uh, legal booklet that has about a dozen pages relating to specifically this issue that we've uh, received copyright permission from the lawyer who's also the author of that book to provide extracts of those pages to uh, neighbours or landowners within Vincent who might have these types of concerns and questions and um, I'm aware of at least half a dozen instances where we've done exactly that. Um. Right, so, I mean, I, I'm not going to labour the point. I guess the question that was asked of us I feel as a council is that if that obligation or that right exists, to what level does council is council able to support that right? And the query was, could you could we introduce a local law that would then allow council to compel the owner of the tree to comply with what is an existing right? So rather than incurring the cost or going to court to seek those costs, actually having a local law at council that says there is a tree overhanging, it's falling in gutters. It's, so the, I guess the, the discussion that we've had within the report and in and around it about defining it as nuisance or otherwise is kind of immaterial. That right exists. It's, it's that the onus is 100% on the person who is affected by it to, to I suppose, through civil action or otherwise pursue that right. Um, but at the point where you have... Uh, and it could be tree roots or otherwise, but the, the idea of going out and chopping a thin stick with a shovel is different to having to dig up fences, remove and, and potentially exhume uh, you know, tens of kilograms or more of, uh, of, of root uh, that, that are on your property. So I think that to an extent we may have missed the mark. I understand that the, a lot of this is about the talk of what is nuisance and what what are, you know, what are we doing demanding people plant more trees and then letting them cut it down, but it's more so... I think that we may have missed the mark a little bit where the question is specifically about the existing right, but that responsibility doesn't fall on the owner of the tree. It, the financial responsibility and the falls back on the person who's trying to exercise what is uh, an existing right. So uh, not that that's of any help to the debate whatsoever, but um, I... I'm not certain we've seen the last of the request for a local law in relation to, to this, but uh, certainly... in. I agree wholeheartedly that in relation to trying to define what nuisance means, it's not our role and our job, and there is sufficient legislation and plenty of uh, uh, district court lawyers who'd love to have a, a play with those sorts of things. So, um. Thank you, Councillor Tupperberg. Councillor Lowden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Member. Um, I, I agree with the Administration's recommendation. Um, my preference is that we stay out of this and leave it as a civil matter as it is. There is very clear legislation around this and a process for people, as Councillor Topwick work has laid out. Councillors, if there's nothing further, I'll put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. OK, we'll now move on to item 12.1, New Draft Policy number 3.10.3, .3, Street Activation. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item, please? 
Moved to Councillor Castle. Seconded. Councillor Harley. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I'm not going to talk for long on this other than to say I'm very happy to see this policy before Council. It's something that's been discussed for quite some time and is a welcome uh, change to what was previously an onerous um, obligation on residents who wanted to organise small-scale activations. Uh, and it's perfect timing, ready for the silly season to begin sooner than we think. Councillor Harley. Um, ditto to that, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the submissions. And now I actually live on a neighbourhood street as opposed to a main street. I might actually have a street park. <laughs> you know how to do it now. <laughs> yep, yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to the submissions. Councillors? Look, I'll just briefly say I think that this, I, I, I love this one too. I think this ultimately builds on Vincent's common sense approach as we've delivered around verges and uh, our fresco. We want to bring people out onto the streets, build community, and I think that this delivers on that. Um, yes, my question is to the uh, Director of Community Engagement. Um, is it anticipated that this will be ready to go in time for Christmas? Uh, yes, uh, through you, presiding member. We uh, are ready to go to um, start the, the public comment process this week. Um, so we're hopeful it might be a stretch to get it back to the October council meeting, but um, at worst it will be November, um, importantly, but um, certainly based on the discussions that last week's briefing session, all of the supporting materials are, are being finalised for the purposes of public comment, which means um, we'll certainly be ready to go um, about a month before silly season and given the anticipated um, turnaround times, particularly with the local and neighbourhood events, that should uh, enable the, the silly season events to be supported. Fantastic, thank you. If there's nothing further, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Okay, so we're now going to return back to development services. 9.6, Amendment 1 to Local Planning Policy Number 7.1.1, Built Form. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Um, noting that we... Um, is there a desire to move the um, motion in parts? I'm just trying to... So, so that um, we'll consider um, all the elements of the recommendation bar 1.3 um, as per previous discussions around top, uh, Councillor Toppleberger running the table. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Move, Councillor... No? Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved, Councillor Toppleberg. Seconded. Moved, moved in part. Oh, yes, moved in part. Councillor Toppleberg... Obviously not, not moving part 1.3. Any seconder for this item? Councillor Loden, thank you. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. I was sitting outside before thinking I'd better make my comments worth it considering that I asked to remain in the chamber. Um, so I, I'm supportive of the changes that have been proposed. I still think this is work in progress. I still think that uh, the the task of creating a one-size-fits-all policy in an attempt to provide uh, to provide a framework uh, that is easily understood and that carries universal principles, I support that. Uh, but I'm yet to see in practice, I think we're seeing in terms of landscaping, absolutely, but in practice in terms of the actual built form and design outcomes, I'm yet to see in practice where uh, not so much that we are demanding excellence, but where we are preventing rubbish. Uh, that still seems to be that uh, largely if you can fit rubbish inside a particular shaped box, you're allowed to build it, and that still irks me greatly. But I spent eight and a half years or nearly nine years in here trying to work out how to fix that and got another three and a bit to go. So uh, we'll get there. But uh, that's, and that, that's a genuine... Uh, I, I genuinely feel that. You know, we had... Oh, leave those remarks to the side, but I, I think that the, um, I, I 
respect and understand the alignment with uh, the principles of the last draft that we've seen of Design WA. I've had <coughs> numerous ex well, exposure to different uh, people involved with Design WA, consultants, people within the Office of the Government Architect, uh, the MRA, the WAPC, our staff and otherwise, and I don't think anyone can actually tell us exactly what Design WA currently looks like, or what the you know, whether it be apartment design guidelines or Design WA, what actually is going to uh, come forth, and so I think there will probably be through with another round of uh, alignment uh, um, amendments going forward. Uh, the basic principles of what, for me, what I think has been great about where we've arrived with the policy is that whilst we're still uh, consulting on it, the elements of Imagine Vincent and the elements that we've found that resonate with our community, uh, we are not only putting front and centre in terms of what we're asking of the community, but we're leading the sector in doing so, uh, particularly in relation to landscaping, in relation to streetscape. Uh, I think we have a really good sensitive balance of setback, uh, um, setback provisions. Uh, I'll still happily sit down for hours and did try prior to the meeting for someone to explain setback provisions in relation to the rights of way, but we'll agree to disagree, and Steph and I will dine out on that another time. But, uh, look, largely uh, the, the challenges that I think that we've got going forward, and I don't think that they're resolvable at this stage, as I said, it's a, uh, I think it's a, this is a, a stepped process towards getting uh, a finer grain planning uh, policy that will specifically uh, eradicate some of the poor design outcomes that we, that we do see. Um, I think uh, my questions that remain, I suppose, and they're not meant to be answered, they're just questions at the moment, is what we do with that space that we're creating, particularly in town centres with those side setbacks in the upper floors. I think that those are still undefined, as in we said that it potentially provides opportunities for light into adjoining properties, but not necessarily, and given the scale and height of some of what's allowed, if you've got six storeys and you've got three metre setbacks from floors three to six, what's actually going on in those spaces, I think that's something we need to define. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave my comments there. I did, I did have some amendments that I was going to propose, but I also think that I'm happy for this to, uh, to, to progress as it is, and I think that there'll be another round of finer grain analysis of the policy. So, and I appreciate the opportunity of my colleagues and the wise counsel, I assume, of the CEO for a way for me to sit in the chamber for this component of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Loden. Um, the only thing I'll add is I'm um, uh, particularly pleased to see the uh, ESD provisions that have been included in here, particularly the, the deemed to comply provisions, which will make significant difference as we discuss uh, future developments, particularly um, some of the larger ones on the JDAP, providing that clarity on what the city's expectations are and, and how that can be actually implemented into those designs as well. Anything further, councillors? Oh, look, I'll just briefly say, yes, I'm supportive of this. I absolutely echo Councillor Toppelberg's um, commentary in relation to this is a journey that we're all on, I think. Um, um, and I think in this situation, I'm absolutely supportive of um, the provisions around landscaping, moving towards alignment with the, design, the draft Design WA, um, inclusion of objectives to address privacy through design rather than just screening, and also the strengthening of requirements for the implementation of environmentally sustainable design. Um, if there's nothing further, I will put the item. All those in favour? Sorry, um, presiding member, just noting um, Councillor Tolberg's vote won't be counted because Councillor Tolberg just sought uh, approval to participate in the debate, but not on the William Street guidelines and not approval to vote. So it is. Okay. That's correct. Okay, so um, we'll just... I thought we moved an amendment so that he could... No? OK. No, my, uh, that was my understanding as well, that Councillor Topperberg would be allowed... We would consider this in part excluding 1.3 around the William Street guidelines, so Councillor Topperberg, however... It, that is true. It, it did not reflect the, the request from Councillor Topperberg at the time. So, OK. So perhaps we were sure... Um, through you, uh, presiding member, no, that won't be necessary, because Council did grant Councillor Tobelberg approval to remain and to participate in the debate, but in relation to the William Street Guidelines recommendation 1.3 to not be present in the chamber when that component is discussed. 
So we are voting on the um, the motion that ex excluding 1.3. Councillor Toppelberg is here and has participated but will not be voting on this particular component of uh, what we're considering. Uh, can I, all those in favour? Carried unanimously with the exception obviously of Councillor Toppelberg who is not voting. And then we'll move on to 1.3 which relates to the William Street Design Guidelines. Councillor Toppelberg will exit the chamber. Um, I presume I require a separate mover and seconder for this particular component. May I have a mover and seconder? Can moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. Councillor Loden, nothing further from you. Councillor Hallett, councillors? No, in that case I will put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, noting Councillor Toppelberg is absent and may be retrieved. So we're now moving on to confidential items or matters. No. Oh, that's correct. My apologies. 11.2, authorisation of expenditure for the period of the 25th of July 2018 to the 21st of August 2018. Councillor Murphy, uh, who has declared an interest, will be leaving the chamber. May I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Harley, Councillor Loden. No comment, Councillor Harley? Councillors? No? I'll put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, noting Councillor Murphy is absent and he may now be retrieved. We'll now move on to uh, the confidential items, matters for which the meeting may be closed. Item 18.1, the Chief Executive Office annual, Office's Annual Performance Review 2017-18. May we, uh, can I have a mover and a seconder to go behind closed doors? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in 